Ben. <clears throat> we love partnering with the City Rescue Mission and their important work they've done here for many years in the city, reaching out to those that are less fortunate and to the homeless. And uh, we, we, we support them financially. We love to go out and volunteer and serve there and praying for them. So thanks for joining us. And like Ben said, the Globe will be up at the altar at the end of the service during the final song. Well, today is, is the beginning of Holy Week, and hopefully you did get one of these uh, devotionals. There's still some available. They're also available electronically. And these are great because what it'll do is it'll take you through each day of the week and show you exactly what was happening on Monday, what Jesus was doing on Tuesday as we lead towards, you know, uh, the final the final three big days of, of Holy Week. And so it'll help you in your, your devotional time. But I wanted to start today. Today is Palm Sunday. We call it Palm Sunday. They didn't call it that in Israel at the time. And I'm gonna explain that in just a moment. But before I even get there, I wanted to open up with this. Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, he gives what we call the Great Commission. He stands there in Matthew chapter 28 and he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go make disciples of all nations. This is important because Jesus is about to give them this imperative and they need to understand whose authority he is speaking from. And he said, he's basically saying, you heard me preach, you saw the miracles, you saw me crucified, you saw me buried and now you see me standing before you alive. Therefore, you understand all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we're going to do that next Sunday. We're going to have an amazing Easter celebration with baptisms during the service. It's going to be powerful. Some of the testimonies that have been coming in from some of those that are being baptized will really inspire you and encourage you. It's going to be an important day. And being baptized is, cri is critical. There's three reasons to be baptized. Number one, to demonstrate that your life has changed. When you put your faith in God by, by trusting Jesus Christ, it changes your life. The second thing is to declare a new association, or the way Eastman will be saying it to the kids, is to declare, to let everybody know, I'm on team Jesus. That's what team I'm on, right? And so when you're baptized, you're letting the whole world know, this is what team I'm on. I'm on team Jesus. And to follow Jesus' example. He did it himself, and he said to do it. And so we're gonna be doing that next Sunday. And as we take time today and through the events of this week to remember, to retrace, to re-enter the story and reflect on all the things that happened during this week, it brings back into the reality the authority of King Jesus. It reminds us, all authority is his. Who else is worthy of following? It brings that right back into focus. Everything in the Old Testament points to the events of this week. And everything in the New Testament points back to the events of this week. This week is different than all other weeks. This week is set apart from all other weeks. This week is Holy Week. And that's why it's called Holy Week, because it's set apart. It's different than all other weeks. And today is Palm Sunday. And that's what we call it. But you know, it is possible to go through an event like this and miss it and miss the point. I mean, I grew up in church for years and, you know, celebrated Palm Sunday. And I didn't really understand, okay, I knew they were waving palm branches and they were excited, but, but I missed the point. It's possible to do that, and I don't want you to miss the point today. Even, in fact, those that were gathered there in Jerusalem as Jesus rode in, many of them were devout religious people, and they missed the point. The Pharisees, they're very devout. The Sadducees were very devout. The Essenes, the Zealots, they were all passionate about their beliefs, and those were the primary, those were the four primary theological beliefs at the time of Jesus, and they all had good reason to have their feelings and to have their beliefs, to have their convictions. The Pharisees or the Sadducees, they believed that the Messiah was gonna come from a royal line, a holy king. The Pharisees believed that righteousness was gonna come through the law and the Messiah would bring righteousness and judgment. The Essenes, they were a contemplative community. They, they believed that, it, that it, was, it was through personal piety that the kingdom of God is not of this world and the natural world was to be avoided. The zealots believed that the Messiah was gonna come and overthrow the Roman government and establish his kingdom on earth. And they all believed that from scripture. They all had been reading the Old Testament, the prophets, the law, and they were interpreting it. And then this is what they were expecting it to look like. Were they right or were they wrong? 
They were all right, and they were all wrong. Their discernment about what they read in scriptures was correct, but the way they expected it to look was a lot different than it actually looked. The Sadducees were right. Jesus did come from a royal line. He is the king of kings. The Pharisees were right. right. He brought righteousness and judgment. He fulfilled the law. The Essenes were right. The kingdom of God is not of this world. And it requires some personal devotion. The zealots are right. He did come to overthrow a kingdom, but not the Roman government. He came to overthrow the kingdom of darkness. So they were all discerning something correctly, but they missed it when it was right in front of them. I don't want us to do that too. If it's possible for them to miss it, it's possible for us to miss it. The zealots, in fact, were one of the ones that had the palm branches because those came from the time of Maccabees, the Maccabees, and it really reflected like independence. It was more like waving a flag. It wasn't just some random branches. They're waving these palm branches and they're throwing them down. Others are throwing their cloaks on the road, right? The zealots were shouting, Hosanna, God save us, right? And I think that If I could submit this to you, this is one of the adjustments I have to make every year. And we come into this story, we go through this week every year, and one of the adjustments I always have to make is I'm reminded of how their praise, their adoration, their shouts of Hosanna, their waving the palm branches were actually the palm branches of their own expectations. And that's why just a few days later, the same people that were saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the same ones where they're throwing their cloaks down on the road in front of Jesus as he rode in are the same ones that shout, crucify him. Because see, here's what happens. When we expect God to do something a certain way and he doesn't do it the way we expect, we turn. I don't believe that anymore. We turn on him. I get personally hurt, I'm disappointed. Some expectation of mine is not fulfilled and so crucify him. It's very possible. And so for me, I'm reminded every year to lay down, when I lay down those palm branches, to lay down my own expectations. I put my faith and my trust in you, even if it looks different than I expect. You guys okay? Everybody seems real serious. (laughs) Yeah, get to business. Matthew chapter 21, verse one. Now when they drew near Jerusalem, and came to Bethphage to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowds spread their cloaks on the road. Others cut palm branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowds said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Who is this? Who is this Jesus? It's a really good question. That's the question that all of us have to answer at some point. Who is Jesus and who is Jesus to you? To get better insight on what was happening on this particular day, we need to go back to Exodus. Exodus is the gospel of the Old Testament. Exodus chapter six through 12 is the story of Passover. In Exodus chapter six, God makes some promises to Israel while they're still slaves. And God tells them, I'm gonna bring you out of Egypt. I'm gonna deliver you from being slaves. I'm gonna redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. I'll be your God and you'll be my people. The people almost can't even hear this they, they can't, they've never been free. They don't know what it means to be free. They almost can't even hear the promise. They just can't believe it. And so then in chapter seven through 11 is this incredible showdown between God and Pharaoh. As Moses says, let my people go. This is what God says, let my people go so they may worship me. And Pharaoh gets stubborn and says no. And so then there's these 10 plagues that happen. 
And each one of these plagues is tied to something that Egypt worshiped. And so God is one by one dismantling these gods of Egypt and showing his sovereignty over all things. It's amazing, chapter seven through 11. And then in chapter 12 is the final one. And it's gonna be the angel of death. And God tells Israel, there's gonna be a way for you, for this angel of death to pass over you. And I've provided this for you. You take a sacrificial lamb and you put the blood of that lamb over the doorpost of your home and the angel of death will pass over. Exodus chapter 12, verse three. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of the month, each man is to select a lamb for his family, one for each household. On the 10th day of the month, this is the day that Jesus rides into Jerusalem. We call it Palm Sunday. The reason so many were gathered there in Jerusalem was for this purpose, to select a lamb that was gonna be offered for their sacrifice. It was lamb selection day. That's why they were there. And Jesus rides in and God is saying, here is the lamb I've selected. This is lamb selection day, here it is. Here's the lamb. John the Baptist had said this earlier. When Jesus approached him at the Jordan, John stops everything and he says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Already a foreshadowing of this, but they still don't understand it. And Jesus rides in on Lamb Selection Day. The Lamb is the most used description of Jesus in Scripture over 104 times. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says, Christ, our Passover Lamb, is sacrificed for us. In fact, many ancient liturgies use that phrase when they celebrate communion. Christ, our Passover Lamb, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Revelation chapter five, verse 12, in a loud voice they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. That's what's going on on Palm Sunday. Verse four of Exodus chapter 12, if any household is too small for the whole lamb, they must share it with their nearest neighbor. Passover was never intended to be just an individual thing between me and God, and neither is communion. This is not just an individual thing between you and God. It does have a personal application, but it's for the whole community. He starts off saying, tell the whole community of Israel this. And then he says, if your household is too small, you need to get with somebody else and and share this meal together. And as we go into Holy Week, I wanna submit to you that our household is too small. We need to share, and I don't mean this particular church, I mean as, as the body of Christ, as the family of God. In fact, when Jesus was celebrating Passover, and I mentioned this a few moments ago when we did communion, when he did the third cup, the cup of redemption, and he says, this is the new covenant in my blood, according to one gospel account, Jesus never drank the fourth cup. Because it says, as he puts it down, he says, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. And why is that? Because the fourth cup is tied to the fourth promise. I will be your God and you will be my people. That promise is still being fulfilled. We'll be sharing that cup with him. And so that's why today and through this week, I wanna encourage you, our household is too small. Who can you share the lamb with? And I really wanna encourage you to do two things and don't get nervous or feel pressure or guilted But I want to encourage you to do two things, and you do it the way you do it. You do it in a way that fits your personality. The first thing is this, invest in someone. Just invest in somebody. A coworker, a neighbor, a family member, somebody that your kids play sports with. In Luke chapter 19, all four gospels record the triumphal entry. And in Luke chapter 19 is where Jesus rides in on Palm Sunday. And just prior to that, as he's approaching Jerusalem, in Luke chapter 19, verse one, there's a famous story that all of you know, the story of Zacchaeus. Luke chapter 19, verse one. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, 
for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and he came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He's gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner? And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, half, the half of my goods I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. And there's so much in this story that's worth drilling down into that we don't even have time to do today. Zacchaeus was considered a traitor. He was Jewish, yet he was a tax collector. And when Zacchaeus says, I will pay fourfold, and he was actually admitting to be a thief. Because under Jewish law, if, you, if someone was stealing, they would be required to pay fourfold. I mean, there's so many things in here. But the point I want to make is that when Jesus sees him, he invests in him. He spends time with him. He calls him by name. And of all the people here, I'm going to go to your house today. In fact, later we'll look and we'll see how the, the lamb is supposed to be without blemish and it's inspected and Jesus was put on trial. And do you know that there were three things he was accused of? None of them were sin, but here's what he was accused of. He was accused of being a friend of sinners. If you ever get accused of anything, I hope it's that. Be a friend of sinners. He was accused of healing on the Sabbath. By the way, you're all sinners anyway, just in case. Don't get all righteous and act like we all sin. And I need friends, right? So you can be my friend. So, so the third thing Jesus was accused of was... Uh, saying that he was the son of God. Being friend of sinners, healing on the Sabbath, and, and claiming to be the son of God. But Jesus here, he takes some time and he invests in Zacchaeus. And one of my favorite stories, I haven't shared it in a while, but I sometimes share it at Growth Track, but it's, it's such a great example of this, one of my favorite personal examples, and it's actually of Barbara. Wherever we live, she goes out of her way to be friends with our neighbors and to connect with them. And we were living over here in Dolphin Cove many years ago. The couple that lived across the street from us when we moved in was an older couple in their 70s. And so we went over to introduce ourselves and meet them. And uh, when Cy, the husband, found out I was a minister, he quickly let me know he was an atheist. I'm an atheist, don't talk to me about God, the Bible. We're like, oh, okay, okay, well, thank you for letting me know that. You know, I mean, he was very you know, adamant. But we continued to build a relationship with him, or should I say Barb did, if she made... A pot of chili, she'd make two and take them one. If she made a casserole, she'd make two and take them one. If she was going to Walgreens, no, don't take this personally, but a lot of times when we get a little bit older, we always need things from Walgreens. We gotta get something from the farm. If Barb was gonna go to Walgreens, she would call up Sue. Hey, Sue, I'm going to Walgreens. Do you need anything or do you wanna go with me? She would take Sue to Walgreens. Fast forward now a couple of years. We continued that friendship with them. And Cy was a businessman, and during the Billy Graham uh, crusade during those years, we discovered that prior to the big Billy Graham outreaches, they have a series of rallies prior to, to build moment. They have a youth rally. I was a youth pastor, so I was all pumped about the youth rally. I know what a youth rally is going to be like. It's going to be loud music, a lot of energy, passionate, you know. It's going to be a youth rally. But then they also had a senior citizens rally. As a youth pastor and a young man at the time, I was very curious about what that might look like. What does a senior citizen rally look like? I don't know. But the guest speaker was Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A. And we had seen over at Sai's house that they had, he had a magazine that was like a business journal magazine, and it had a, on the cover was Truett Cathy. And so we saw this connection. So it was going to be on a Saturday morning down at the Prime Osborne. And so we invited Cy and Sue. We said, hey, we're going to go down to this event at the Prime Osborne. Truett Cathy is the guest speaker. Uh, would you guys be interested in going? And Cy said, oh, yeah, I'd be very interested to hear what that guy says, because he respected him as a businessman. So we go down to the senior citizens rally. Here I am, youth pastor, with these two people at the Senior Citizen Rally. I'm going to tell you, it was a rally. Don't tell me old people don't like loud music. It was loud. And there were lights going everywhere. The Chick-fil-A cow came out and was throwing out coupon books. You should have seen them going for the coupon books. I mean, they had their like, give me, that's my, give me that cane. I'm going to get that's my coupon book. 
I mean, it was intense. And then Truett Cathy comes out and he begins to speak about the important decisions he made in his life that helped him be successful. But then he said, he, he said the most important decision he ever made had nothing to do with business, yet it affected everything he ever did. And he goes into this great explanation and about yielding his life to God by putting his faith and trusting in Jesus for his salvation. And he said, if you're here today and you've never done that, I wanna encourage you to make that decision today. He goes on a few moments later and asks, if you wanna make that decision, would you raise your hand? Barb and I are sitting there, Cy raised his hand. <laughs> Cy gave his life to the Lord that day. He was 80 years old. One year later, he died. And I'm absolutely convinced that Cy's eternal destiny was changed partly because of somebody taking time to invest in them. Who can you invest in? You don't have to try to close the deal. You don't have to try to be an evangelist unless that's your gift. But who can you invest in? Who can you say, Zacchaeus, hey, let's go get coffee today. Who can you spend some time with? Just invest in. In fact, Billy Graham research and their organizational research shows that of all the people that even come to faith at a Billy Graham event, came so because of the second reason, someone invited them. And that's the second thing, is invite somebody. Invest in someone, invite someone. Invite them to your life group, invite them to church, invite them to some other outreach, invite them to something. In John chapter one, verse 35, it says, the next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, John the Baptist, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. His, he first found his brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Some translations say in verse 41, the first thing Andrew did was to go find his brother. So after meeting Jesus, the first thing Andrew did is to go get his brother, Peter, and said, Listen, just come with me. Let me just, let's just go see Jesus together. Just, just come with me, right? He didn't, the first thing Andrew did, not after he went through catechism class, not after he went through personal discipleship and growth classes, not after he went to Bible college or seminary and got it, the first thing he did, you don't have to know everything, you don't have to be a theologian, you don't have to be a Bible scholar, just go get somebody, just be Andrew, just, li just listen, just come to church with me. Just try it. They might say no. They might say yes. We invited Cy and Sue. They could have easily said no, but they said yes. Invite somebody. Who is somebody you can invite? And right now, let me just say, that we have two things in our favor. One is the difficulty people have been through over this last year or so. People need hope. They're looking for something. They're looking for connections. The second thing is it's Easter. It's just an easy time to break the ice and invite somebody. Hey, go to church with me on Easter. It's gonna be great. Invite someone. They, invite them just to join online if they're not comfortable coming in person or going somewhere. Just invite them to join online that way. Verse five of Exodus chapter 12, it says, the animals you choose must be without defect. The lamb was examined. In fact, when Jesus, when you read after he rides in on Palm Sunday, and you'll see this in the devotional on Monday, he goes down to the temple, and this is where he begins to flip over the tables and run the people out of the temple. Because what was happening is people were coming with the lamb they selected on lamb selection day, and they're coming to the priest to have it examined, and the priest is saying, oh, no, no, this one's not good, but you can purchase one of ours. And they were exploiting the moment. That's why Jesus was so ticked off. The lamb is examined and without blemish. Jesus was, was put on trial. Pilate says, I find no fault in him. He was examined. He was tempted in every way, the Bible says, as we are, yet without sin. 
the lamb was without blemish. Peter says this in, in chapter one, first Peter chapter one, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed for your empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. And then in verse six, it goes on to say, take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. And that's when Jesus was crucified. Leviticus chapter 17 gives us some insight into this. Levitical law says this, for the life of every creature is in the blood and I've given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. And Jesus' blood was an eternal sacrifice once and for all. The lamb, was, the lamb was to be slaughtered at twilight. The soldiers led him inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him with a purple cloak, which is why this time of the year we put purple on the altar. They clothed him with a purple cloak and twisted a crown of thorns, put it on him. They began to salute him, hail king of the Jews. They were striking him on the head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And they mocked him. And then they stripped him of his purple cloak, which is why when we get to Monday, Thursday and Good Friday, the altar is stripped and made bare. And they led him out to be crucified. Verse seven of Exodus chapter 12. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of their house in which they eat it and then they shall eat the flesh that night. And this is for us where the personal application applies, where it is a personal thing. You take by faith the blood of the lamb and you apply it to the doorpost of your heart. Even if you don't understand, I'm sure there were those in Israel that didn't understand. How is that gonna help? God says, the angel of death is going to visit this area. And if you put the blood of the lamb over the doorpost of your house, the angel of death will pass over. And they didn't understand, but what they did know, they had seen in chapter seven through 11, as we have it, they had seen God dismantle the gods of Egypt, showing his sovereignty. So they go, okay, I don't, maybe someone said, I don't understand this, but I trust him. Seeing what he's already done, I'm gonna, I'm gonna trust him. And I'll encourage you today to trust him to by faith apply that blood to the doorpost of your heart and it is by faith. Everything takes faith. I get into discussions with really smart people sometimes that wanna have evidence and proof and scientific this and that. Hey, all that stuff takes faith. Everything takes faith. When you go eat at a restaurant, it takes faith or they didn't put something in your food or do something to it. When you, when you put money in the bank, it takes faith to trust that those people are gonna do what they're supposed to do. When you drive down Roscoe Boulevard at 35 miles an hour, because I know none of you speed. When you drive down Roscoe Boulevard at 35 miles an hour, you have faith that the person coming directly at you at 35 miles an hour is gonna stay six feet away from you. That takes a lot of faith. I don't know them. Right? Everything takes faith. To say there's, everybody has to have faith, put faith in something. I wanna encourage you to put your faith in him. You're sitting in that chair right now today by faith. You, you're trusting that someone who built that chair made a chair strong enough and good enough to hold you. You didn't walk in here and examine it, flip it over and check out. You just sat in it by faith. You sat down in it. And I wanna encourage you to, put, to do the same thing to sit down in the grace of God by faith. It's the only thing that can change us. It's the only thing that makes a difference. I remember hearing the testimony in, uh, of this, it was a, a leader of the Black Panther movement in 1971. He got saved. He gave his life to Jesus. And here's what he said, leader of the Black Panther movement, he said, I believed that I could change the world through the Black Power movement until I met Jesus. And then all the hate and all the bitterness were taken away. And he goes, now I know I can change the world through Jesus' power. 
because that's the only power that can change someone's heart. That's the only power that can change the world. It's putting your faith in Him and allowing Him to change your heart. Who is Jesus? Who is this Jesus? It's an answer that we have to respond to by faith. Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus, made this prophetic statement about the Messiah. He was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Jesus was betrayed and arrested, put on trial. After the trial, they took him out to be scorched, to be flogged with a cat of nine tails, nine leather strips laced with bone and lead and shards of broken pottery. 39 times those nine straps went across his back, ripping out his flesh. Where do you need healing? By his stripes, you are healed by faith. Then they took him to the praetorium where they placed on his head the crown of thorns, two inch thorns they placed on his head and they beat it into his scalp with the reed. They mocked him, they blindfolded him. Prophesy to us, prophet, who hit you? And they spit on him. What's punishing you? Worry, confusion, depression, fear, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And then they placed the cross on him and made him walk that road up to Golgotha. And there they laid him on that cross. They stretched him out. They drove nail spikes through his hands and his feet were pierced. Do you feel pierced by your own sin? He was pierced for our transgressions. You receive that cleansing and that forgiveness by faith. Is your heart crushed from disappointment, broken promises, failed endeavors, personal failure? Is your heart crushed? He was crushed for our iniquities. That is who this Jesus is, but you have to respond by faith. Would you stand with me as we close today, close this service, and enter into this very important week that's unlike all other weeks. And I think a great way to start and begin this week would be a brand new surrender, yielding our lives to Him. We're gonna pray a prayer together and I'm gonna lead you, but I wanna encourage you, don't just say the words, you repeat this, but mean it in your heart. We're gonna pray a prayer of confession because we all sin and a prayer of surrender and putting our faith and our trust in God through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus. And then we'll close with a final song of worship. And as Ben mentioned, you can, if you have something for the mission offering, there'll be a globe down here. You can bring it at that time during that last song. But let's just bow our hearts before the Lord right now. And let's just pray. Man, I wanna encourage you, mean this. If, if you're like me, it's just a, a, another a, a realignment, a fresh surrender. But maybe you're doing it for the first time. Well, let's all pray this together and let's begin this very significant week this way. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. Have mercy on me and forgive me through your Son, my Savior. Lord Jesus, I believe you lived on this earth. You died for my sin. You rose and now live. I yield to you. Be my Lord. And Holy Spirit, fill me with power and passion to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's just worship the Lord together as we wrap up this service today.